All right, everyone, we are going to get started. Good evening. We would like to welcome you back to our Team Tuesdays webinar series. My name is Kristen Lenig, and I am the Central Field Director for Special Olympics Pennsylvania. Now, in honor of Black History Month, we have a very special webinar presentation for you. Tonight's presentation will feature the second installment of SOPA's Diversity and Inclusion Town Hall series. The program will highlight the ongoing work to promote equity and access to sports for Black Americans. We will share the stories of people who aspired to challenge the barriers and assumptions about their participation in sports. Let me introduce one of our co-MCs tonight, Chase Trimmer, the director of SOPA's Philadelphia program. Good evening, everyone. Hey, Kristen, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm really happy to be back on Team Tuesdays with our next diversity, excuse me, diversity and inclusion town hall uh, series uh, and to be recognizing Black History Month uh, as part of a you know, Heritage Month celebration uh, in the month of February. Uh, before we jump into our program, which I think is a really awesome uh, and I'm really excited about this, uh, this evening's program, I wanna welcome my co-MC, Jesse Rohr, a SOPA athlete from Area M. Jesse became a Special Olympics Pennsylvania athlete when he was seven years old when he trained in athletics. Um, Jesse currently does bowling, soccer, and skiing with Area M. Um, and he, he shared with me that his favorite competition to attend and compete at is Fall Fest. Thank you, Chase, very much. It is my pleasure to serve as co MC for tonight's webinar. I would like to remind everyone that on this webinar, your microphones will be muted and your video cameras will be turned off. Later on, you will have the opportunity to ask questions by typing them into the Q&A box. This webinar will be recorded and posted to the SOPA YouTube channel. Thanks, Jesse. Uh, and it's now time to welcome our guests. Tonight, we are excited to welcome some representatives from the Black Women in Sport Foundation. The Black Women in Sport Foundation is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to increase the involvement of Black women and girls in all aspects of sport, including athletics, coaching, and administration. Please welcome uh, three members from the Black Women in Sport Foundation, Tolu Amakore, Lucy Mason, and the Executive Director, Kayla Stuckey. They're gonna start off with their presentation, giving uh, us some background on the organization and the work that they do. Um, and uh, then uh, join us, uh, Tolu and Lucy will also join us again for uh, the Q&A session at the end of our program. Tolu, Kayla, Lucy, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So my name is Kayla Stuckey, and I am the interim executive director for Black Women in Sport Foundation. I've been involved with Black Women in Sport Foundation in various capacities for about five years. So I'm very excited to give this presentation and give you an introduction to Black women in sport. Okay, you can go to the next one. Okay. The Black Women in Sport Foundation founders, Professor Pina Sloan Green, Dr. Alpha Alexander, Dr. Nikki Frank, and Professor Linda Green crossed paths through their passion for sport and commitment to equality in all aspects of sport. And they crossed paths at Temple University. Although um, Black Women in Sport Foundation was incorporated in 1992, their work came much earlier than that. Um, and since this is Black History Month, I would like to highlight some of the key achievements that our founders have, um, have achieved throughout the years. Uh, next slide. Dr. Alpha Alexander, who we will be hearing from later, and I'm really excited for you guys to hear her story. She um, was a multi-sport, or she is a multi-sport Hall of Fame athlete at the College of Wooster. She held multiple positions with the YWCA. She served on the Olympic and Pan American Sports Advisory Council. And she is a past member of the United States Olympic Committee Board of Directors. Dr. Nikki Frank was a member of the 1976 and 1980 U.S. Olympic fencing, fen, excuse me, fencing teams. She was a silver medalist in the 1975 Pan American Games. 
She started the fencing program at Temple University in 1972, and she's still coaching today. And she's an International Sports Hall of Fame. Okay. Professor Lindsey Green. She was a nationally ranked track and field athlete at California State University, Long Beach. <clears throat> She's a former civil rights and constitutional lawyer at the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund. She was the first African-American woman to teach at Temple University and Harvard Law Schools. And she is a former counsel to the US Senate Judiciary Committee. Professor Tina Sloan Green is our current president and she has an amazing story. So I'm excited to share this video um, highlighting some of her story. Sometimes we're reminded how sports mean more to us than the games we play. And the easy one, where's the button? <laughs> and you don't have to look much further than here. On any given morning, small steps eventually lead to a giant leap where a major impact is being made. Keep going, keep going. Look at your ball. Don't look at anything else. Just look at your ball. The mission is, is simple. We want to increase opportunities for African American uh, and girls of color in all aspects of sport, from the playing field to the boardroom. Tina Sloan Green once stepped where no woman of color had walked before. After an All-American lacrosse career at Westchester, she went on to become the first African American in the country to coach lacrosse at the Division I level. Her guidance led the Temple Owls to three national championships. That's when a foundation was set. Everything starts with a dream, and um, from that, that dream became a reality. Green and three colleagues at Temple had the idea to energize young black women and fuel their excitement in non-traditional sports. I know that, um, that sport is, is, it can really um, be a uh, vehicle you know, to, to really um, promote leadership skills, to promote you know, self-esteem. Yeah, that's good, you got it. You got it. From there, the Black Women in Sports Foundation was created, an idea born from passion with a need for inclusion. It was the desire to create familiar surroundings. These kids are now taught how to utilize sports as a way of life and laying their cornerstone for success. It forces you to to um, break down. You know, to to really um, promote leadership skills, to promote you know self-esteem. Yeah, that's good. You got it. You got it. From there, the Black Women in Sports Foundation was created, an idea born from passion, with a need for inclusion. It was the desire to create familiar surroundings. These set. kids are now taught how to utilize sports as a way of life and laying their cornerstone for success. It forces you to, to um, break down some of those barriers that ordinarily exist. And, and sport is that, that, that vehicle that can break down barriers. Success in those early moments, coupled with the evolving era, Green was defining her path. But it was one moment that made her purpose crystal clear. Dr. Martin Luther King has been shot and wounded, possibly critically wounded, in Memphis, Tennessee this evening. I was angry. I was really angry. Um, and why? Everybody wanted to know why. You couldn't believe it. Why? Why, why him? After the tragic events in 1968, someone had to address the students here at Unionville High School. The faculty turned to their only black member. They turned to a young leader, a young African-American woman. Conflicted, but determined. She was the right voice during a very difficult time. And it was then that I made a decision 
But I had to do more. I, I couldn't stay in Unionville anymore. I had to, I had to go back to, to you know, find my way uh, to Philadelphia and, and go back home and, and really make a difference. And, and Dr. King would have wanted me to do that. All the way down, pray for peace of my soul. Say, you know, chop at your fingers soon as you reach and you go. None of my people are scared. We came equipped to prepare. Is that unspoken feeling you can feel in the air? You see, my mother was doing this and my father was doing this. Today, a dream has forged into reality. Here at Building 21 in North Philadelphia, Green's program is flourishing. It's Educational Friday, and success stories with roots cemented in sports have these kids engaged. Soccer took me around the world. I would have never. People remembered me, and when opportunities came up, I got a call. I never played lacrosse until I got to college. I went to girls' high. You know girls high? Reach out. There's your attack. Operating on a shoestring budget, the program continues to thrive for those who have gone through it and are now passing it along to others. Like I'm holding up my end of the bargain. So I see her running the Black Women's Sports Foundation and, and having you know done that for years. And then now she sees me working with children and giving back in my own way through education. So I feel like I, I picked up the torch and I'm carrying it and, and paying it forward. Your confidence and strength the purpose your is not to create great athletes, but to encourage participation in understanding that playing the games can go a long way towards leveling the playing field. It's important these kids know that they have a chance to be whatever they want. And maybe, just maybe, follow in the footsteps of a trailblazer who has carried that belief over time. Way ahead of the game, and just the name is synonymous with sport and with changing the lives of youth in Philadelphia. When you're name dropping, yeah, Tina Sloan Green is quite a name to be able to drop. Yeah, looking back, I think he would have said, you know, uh, you know, job well done, but keep pushing. You know, it's not over yet. <laughs> I, I love that video and it's also a really great um, introduction to uh, Black Women in Sport Foundation's mission. Um, so if you could go to the next slide, please. Awesome. Black Women in Sport Foundation's mission is to increase the involvement of Black women and girls in all, all aspects of sport, including athletics, coaching, and administration. And we do this through community events or scholarships and programs. And I'll be talking about our programs next. Black Women's Sport Foundation uses various programs to advance its mission. And these programs are targeted to young girls, um, school age girls, but we also have um, boys involved in our programs too. And our programs are run after school and in the summer primarily, but we also offer clinics. And in addition to um, learning various sports skills, um, participants also get academic assistance, learn social and life skills. So some of the programs that we have are Amazing Grace, which uh, offers life skills, academics, health and sport fitness activities, exploring the science of sports, uh, which um, are science and math lessons through practicing tennis, lacrosse and fencing. Safety Nets is a violence prevention program and offers conflict resolution and confidence building. And Go Girl Go uh, focuses on peer pressure, stress, and anti-drug use. Okay, here are just a couple of videos highlighting the impact of our programs. You know, a lot of our parents, in particular in the state of Pennsylvania and in Philadelphia, work hourly. And they work long hours. A lot of them go to work from 7 in the morning 
till seven at night. So that means when a mother picks up a child at six o'clock, she's got to go home and prepare dinner. And by the time she finishes that, it's eight o'clock and a kid is doing homework. Well, here we can afford the, the child the opportunity to have homework done. So all the mother has to do is review or go over the sight words or check it out or sign it if the teacher requires it. So we offer a service that's valuable to the development of African American children. They're gonna know each other, they're gonna grow up with each other, they're gonna be friends and they're gonna become um, unit, as a unit with skills like leadership, discipline, and they, they will be athletic and also they will be well prepared in school. Sports in general, especially for females, is very important. I mean, for me particularly, it taught me a lot of life lessons, things that I use in my everyday life, especially having a heavy career. You know, things such as teamwork, um, setting individual and team goals, and then working toward those goals. Um, your individual goals and then obviously your team goals. So sports in general is obviously important. And that helps you get, build a sense of confidence. I feel like I'm a much more confident person after playing hockey for years and years. How do we know that in black women in sport we don't have another Obama or Condoleezza Rice? or Sandy, the, the woman who runs the UN, or all of the variables, the Ben Chavises of the world, but the Martin Luther Kings for that example, the Angela Davises. How do we know that we won't have these kind of people if we don't begin to work into development? If black women in sports do not exist, all the children that we have wouldn't have certain help with certain things. As what was explained earlier, as far as helping with homework, a lot of parents can't do it. A lot of parents don't have that time to sit down with their own child and help them with homework. They need that extra help. And we actually, we give them that extra help. So without that extra help, it's a lot of things they wouldn't do. They wouldn't be doing good in school like they're doing now. The sports, they wouldn't know nothing about. And we also try to explain to the children that the sports that, the non-traditional sports that we teach them now can help you later on in the future. traditional sports um, to you know inner city youth which is important because they don't have the, some people don't have the opportunity to you know play non-traditional sports such, such as tennis golf lacrosse um, field hockey sports like this a lacrosse game can be 13 14 15 goal scored and that's exciting people want to see goal scored people want to see the ball being moved up and down the field as opposed to baseball where it's it's slow They love it. They immediately see that they can pick up a stick. They can run with the ball. They take their basketball skills with um, dodges and picks and screens, and they can apply that to the lacrosse game. So they, they come in not knowing anything about the sport, and they leave absolutely loving it. Like exposure to like sports that you've never thought of in our community with play, like lacrosse, tennis, um, fencing. And it gives the kids a chance to just Play. With, with basketball, it's mostly you're using your hands, you're shooting the ball. Um, with soccer, you're using your feet, you're kicking the ball. With hockey, it's, it's the combination of hand-eye coordination. I'm moving my feet, I'm moving my hands at the same time. Um, so it's complex, and I think that's what makes it um, exciting for people to see people be able to, to manage both of those things at the same time. And then finally, our scholarships are another way that we promote our mission. Um, our scholarships will be opening up um, in March and they help us to encourage more black women to continue in sport beyond participation. Our scholarships are for black female athletes at various levels who have a passion for sports. And um, these two scholarships are awards that we have given in the past and we're also offering again this year, um, along with some other scholarships. So uh, I would 
encourage you to take a look at our scholarship page for the full list of scholarships next week. Um, the Madeline Zugger Kelly Scholarship is awarded to a Black woman athlete who is enrolled in an accredited graduate program. And the Angela Murphy Scholarship is awarded to a Black woman athlete um, graduating high school and enrolled in an accredited college program. Um, and again, this helps us to um, further our mission to uh, help us see more female, uh, Black females go from the playing field to the boardroom. Um, so that concludes my short intro of Black, Black Women in Sport Foundation. Um, <clears throat> I'm excited for you to hear more during the program and I would encourage you to also go to blackwomensport.org to learn more and to stay connected with us. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Kayla and I am back, here I am. All right. Thank you so much uh, for sharing with us the, the mission of the Black Women in Sport Foundation, for sharing the story of uh, Professor Tina Sloan Green, the first African-American woman to become head coach of women's college lacrosse team. Uh, not only did, was she satisfied with, with that accomplishment, she became a three-time national champion, uh, inducted into uh, multiple Hall of Fames, um, recognizing her uh, contributions to the world of sports, um, her own accomplishments on the playing field, and also um, here in, in her home city of Philadelphia and, and across the, the state. And really, um, it sounds like the organization is reaching uh, beyond just Pennsylvania to promote uh, access uh, to sports, access to leadership, uh, and growth opportunities for um, women and also boys um, um, uh, that are Black Americans. And so um, that's really great to learn, learn more. Um, and thank you for sharing the opportunities. I wanted to um, just give everyone a heads up that we'll, we'll, uh, if you have any questions for the Black Women in Sport Foundation, um, feel free to put those in the chat box now. We will do a Q&A portion uh, towards the end of the webinar. Um, but before we transition to our next speaker, um, Jesse, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about how you were introduced to sports and, and what role sports has played in your life. Can you, can you share uh, a little bit about what sports means to you? I was introduced to sports in the first grade, and I was a little shy at first, but eventually I grew to like it. Originally, I started competing in the 50-meter dash and graduated to the 200-meter dash in the fourth grade. I started soccer in 2004. That is still my favorite sport, all thanks to Tim Howard, wow. who is a biracial professional athlete and a former goalkeeper for the U.S. men's national soccer team has been a big influence for me. He's the reason why I play goalie. I feel I can relate to him because of all the challenges that he has had to overcome in his career, including a disability, which is known as Tourette's. When I was younger, I was picked on a lot in school. So his story has really inspired me. One of the best things about sports and my Special Olympics experience has been making friends. Without my soccer team, I wouldn't have one of my best friends, Eric Weller. That's awesome. You were inspired by um, influential figures um, to, to do something uh, maybe they hadn't done before. So, you know, trying out the game of soccer. Um, Tina Sloan Green shared how she was inspired by folks like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. to do something. Um, that was a challenge uh, and, and it's awesome connections. Um, uh, what have you learned from sports? What I basically learned from sports was, you know, overcoming, you know, obstacles, you know, having fun, making new friends, you know, trying out a different sport and having fun with the sport. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned you, you've uh, met one of your best friends, uh, Eric, I think it was, uh, one yeah. of your best friends. Um, is Eric from uh, Area M also? Yes, he is. Him and I actually play on the same soccer team. Oh, okay. So he's your teammate and a friend. That's yeah. Awesome. Um, um, have you and Eric had any uh, chances or opportunities to win, uh, win any competitions, any big competitions together? As a matter of fact, we have. The most recent, well, before the, this pandemic, we basically, you know, headlined Villanova where we basically won a gold medal 
And in 7v7, because, you know, they stopped doing 11v11 after 2018. So that was a huge setback for pretty much all of our soccer team. Mm -hmm. We had split up some of our athletes to different teams and different divisions. Mm -hmm. Well, different, uh, well, different teams. Um, so how did that feel? How does it feel winning a medal? What's that like for you? It's a gift. It's a blessing. It's, you know, like you're fine to say it all paid off. As long as you work together as a team, you have fun, you know, it's been, it's great. It's a great feeling in the world. Cool. Well, um, thanks for sharing your, your stories, uh, Jesse. And um, uh, what do you think is, you think we should welcome Dr. Alpha Alexander uh, and um, can you uh, also introduce our second guest? It is now my honor to welcome someone who I'm sure you all will recognize, Loretta Claiborne, a SOBA athlete from York County and the Chief Inspiration Officer for Special Olympics International. Loretta is an amazing athlete and runner, aside from winning numerous medals in her events. She has also finished 26 marathons, Running is not the only part of Claiborne's life. She holds a fourth degree black belt in karate, communicates in four languages, including American Sign Language, and holds three honorary doctorate degrees. In 1996, she was awarded the Arthur Ashley Award for Courage. Well, thank you. It was nice uh, to be here and see the video. It reminds me so much of the strength of black women having sport at a very early age. To see the young kids with the tennis rackets and with their lacrosse. So many times when I used to talk to students, they would say, I want to be a football player. I want to be a basketball player. The young men. You never heard much from the girls. And a lot of girls started out with playing basketball or I want to be a runner. Of course, my favorite black female in time that I can remember was Wilma Rudolph. She had a bad leg. She wore a brace on her leg. And I remember her trying so hard to become a Tennessee Bell for this uh, Tennessee State University. Evidently, they had a good track team. And somebody told her, oh, you'll never be a Tennessee Bell. Well, she went on to run the Olympics and actually for a long time held the world record. I remember my mother talking about Althea Gibson she played tennis. So, you know, when I grew up, there wasn't much sport. And I grew up in the city of York. I remember going past the Y and stopping after getting our hair done on Saturday, we get it fixed up, you know, pressed and everything or straightened for Sunday church. And I remember stopping at the Y and planting my face against the window saying, one day I'm going to swim in that Y. And my sister would say, come on, Retta, you're never going to swim that Y. Color kids up swimming around that Y. Well, I proved her wrong. Because of Special Olympics, I had that opportunity to swim in that Y. And that brought, brought joy. Just to defy, to see that I was going to be determined that I was going to swim in that Y. Hmm. Or it didn't come easy to me. And I heard the ladies speak in front of, ahead of me. Um, they probably remember the days where girls were only or allowed to only play half court basketball because it would hurt the girls. But being African American or being a black girl, it didn't bother me. But yes, did I have some hurdles? I heard my mom tell her story. I said, did you ever do sports? And she was good at sports. She says, oh, no, that wasn't a thing. Mm -hmm. I would ask her, how was school for you? And she would tell me that school was not pleasant because she went to a segregated school. So she knew what separation and segregation was. She knew she was going to have a challenge with her Loretta, even though she had six other living children and two had passed. So she really had nine children. She knew she was going to have a challenge, but she didn't let that stop her. And when I first got into running, she was against me running. She didn't want me to run. I would go run. My role, what rule was, to run around the projects and you did not go out the parkway projects. Well, I would extend that run and I would extend it a couple streets over and somebody would come, I saw Loretta on Front Street. I said, but Front Street is the projects. And I was determined that I was gonna run. Did I have marathons in my mind at that time? No, I was just fighting to be able to do something that I could do because a lot of kids I could not play with because of my 
intellectual disability. I wasn't smart enough. Everything was about the book. And to me, all I wanted to do was be a part of the group. So I started running and I, the rule was run around the projects and as time went by, I stuck with it. I start martial arts. Oh, that's not good for a woman. Well, even my karate teacher says the best place for one be is at home. And he was German and he came from the Germany at the time when the war was. So it was either follow Hitler or leave. And he left at a young age, but it took him time to get used to me. And I had an issue because there was one gentleman that didn't like black people and he really picked on me and Sensei got whipped to it. He says, I think you're, you're all strong enough to stand on your own two foot feet. And I had to fight my way because I knew every time I would meet up against this guy, he would do something, but I fixed him and I never had no problem after that guy afterwards. Mm -hmm. I never really saw prejudice as a kid because my mom never promoted that. But she left us know in so many ways, look, you're black. And when you walk out that door, there's going to be somebody 10 times better than you. And let me tell you this. I want you to hold up on your own. It's not how much you have. It's what you have and how you use it. And I want you to use everything that you have to its fullest potential. You might won't be the best reader, but don't let nobody step on you. And as time went, when I got into sports, I could tell that when it wasn't that I did, did the sport poorly. I was actually excelled better than the other person, but they would push me back. And I knew it had to be two things. And when I started to admit it, when it comes from sport, I started to admit it. I said, oh, it's about the color of my skin. <laughs> but I didn't let it stop me. I did not let it stop me. And I went on and pushed on and pushed on. And I didn't have nobody to say, Loretta, Come on, don't, don't drop out. The only time I got told that was by Bobby Simpson in karate. He says, Loretta, I think you're tough and you hang in there. And I stuck in there longer than anyone else. When my teacher sat there and says, this is not for women. And I just sat there and looked at Mr. Simpson. He said, don't worry, girl, you can, you're tough. Well, Loretta, I want to Sport is very you. important to me. Um, thank you for being here tonight. I also want to uh, welcome in Dr. Alpha Alexander, um, uh, who is a co-founder of the Black Women in Sport Foundation, uh, born in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, Dr. Alexander started playing sports in 1972 uh, upon entering the College of uh, Worcester in Ohio, uh, where she became a multi-sport Hall of Fame athlete. Uh, Dr. Alexander earned her master's degree and doctorate degree from Temple University in Philadelphia, and I believe that's where um, the uh, Black Women in Sport Foundation uh, originated. Um, and um, Dr. Alexander also served on the Olympic and Pan American Sports Advisory Council, uh, was president of the Arthur, Arthur Ashe Foundation. Uh, and in 2006, uh, the NCAA celebrated its centennial anniversary and included Alpha Alexander in its list of the most uh, 100 most influential student athletes, along with athletes like Jackie Robinson, Arthur Ashe and uh, Jerry Rice. Uh, so Loretta and Dr. Alexander, thank you very much for being here tonight with Special Pennsylvania um, uh, in the celebration of Black History Month. Um, Jesse was telling us earlier about how he got into sports, the impact that it has had on his life. Um, and so I would like to ask you both the same question. Could you talk about how you got introduced to sports, uh, the opportunities that there were for you growing up, um, you know, any limits that there may have been, and, and what role has sports played in your life? Um, and I'd like to ask Dr. Alexander if you uh, would share with us uh, what sports has meant to you. Um, I just uh, like to begin to say it's a pleasure to meet uh, Loretta tonight. I've heard a lot about her, and I'm, I'm very honored that I'm on the same program as she is. Uh, growing up, they did not have sports in school. <laughs> Uh, for women at uh, my school, at high school. Uh, a friend of my mother, a, a teacher, my mother was a teacher, he uh, introduced me to tennis and that's how I got involved with tennis and eventually became the city of Dayton champion in, in tennis. Uh, we had an opportunity, I had an opportunity to play softball and I got injured, got spiked. I was a catcher at that time. And uh, my father wasn't particularly 
uh, happy that I decided to give up tennis and play softball. So uh, he uh, he sort of ended uh, my participation in um, in 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 softball. Um, my father uh, taught me, and this is very important, to learn about other sports. Uh, football. I knew about the rules and stuff. I didn't play it, but as a as a girl later on in life, it was very valuable for me that I was able to talk to men and women about football and know about football. So that that's one important uh, um, a thing that you can carry on, um, you know, later on in life. But I went on and had the opportunity uh, to play sports in college. Uh, the College of Worcester had 13 sports for women, and I played volleyball, basketball, and played tennis uh, at the College of Worcester. For me, uh, yes, there was a lot of prejudice. Uh, as you know, um, I'm now living in Tennessee. My father took me out of Tennessee because he did not want me growing up here. I grew up in Dayton, Ohio. Guess where I live now? I'm back in Tennessee. And it's the reason is to fight the prejudice that is occurring down South. And yes, it is still occurring. Uh, mm -hmm. There's some fights that I've been able to uh, transition into and fight here uh, in civil rights issues that I'm, I'm, I'm really involved with also. But um, the opportunity, I knew that there was something that I wanted to do. A lot of people from the College of Wooster, they transcend on to graduate school and that's how I ended up at Temple and had a chance to meet Tina Sloan Green, Nikki Frank and Linda Green and formulate the Black Women Sports Foundation because we really saw that the opportunity for African-American women to have accessibility in all sports uh, really was not available and particularly non-traditional sports. I'll, I'll let Loretta talk now. <laughs> Yeah, Loretta, you, you had mentioned yeah, um, about some uh, opportunities, uh, limits uh, earlier. Anything that you wanted to add uh, to how you were introduced to sports? I was introduced to sport really by my brother, Hank. We had a field in back of our house and he, would, he was allowed because he was the runner. He ran long distance, which was not traditional to African-Americans. And I remember him playing football and they all walked off the football team. The whole team walked off the field because the coach made a rude statement to the young men. So the whole York High football team walked off the field and Hank got into cross country and he had some you know, things said to him but he never left that stopped him. But I followed my brother Hank and when too many of the guys were around my mom says, okay Loretta, you don't need to be hanging around the guys. So I just continued to keep up running because he was a long distance runner. But I can remember in you know, certain sports that I've seen some, some drawback because you know being African-American or being black martial arts was one of them. Uh, but I was just into sport. I love sport. It's what I do. A lot of people says, oh, how many gold medals you have? And I look at them and say, you know, I don't count medals. I count the opportunities that I have through sport. Um, Jesse, do you have a question for Loretta and Dr. Alexander? I do. What presence and impact did sports have in your community growing up? Uh, for me, I lived out in the country. And uh, if it wasn't uh, for, and uh, he's my play brother that lived across the street. Um, he taught me how to catch a ball he, and um, things of, uh, of that sort. The opportunity was not available uh, in, in, in my school, uh, particularly uh, for girls to participate in sports. So I played in the band. I played a clarinet in the band. Uh, but like Loretta, uh, Wilma Rudolph and Athea Gibson were my two role models, you know. But uh, later on in life, I've been uh, very uh, uh, blessed uh, to have the opportunity to meet uh, a lot of uh, athletes and uh, particularly Arthur Ashe was a friend of mine. And uh, he uh, was double A and I was double A. That's what we each called each other. And it was important. Uh, Arthur really gave back to the community. So the opportunity didn't exist when I was there for sports, uh, but uh, it, the uh, teaching 
and, and giving back to the community is very, very important for all of us to be able to do. And I, I think that's extremely important for us to give back. Um, uh, you, you both already sort of talked a little bit about how um, um, sports uh, had an impact on your direct community and your personal lives. Um, I, I was wondering if you could uh, share a little bit more, you know, even broadly, um, figures such as Wilma uh, Rudolph and, and others, um, other Black Americans that were involved in sports and were recognizable figures uh, at that time. Um, what presence and impact did sports have on uh, Black Americans in general um, in our country, um, uh, you know, while you were both kind of growing up. So, uh, Loretta, would you uh, take that question? You got to remember that sports for women in general didn't really have an impact. We were not allowed to run on the same tracks. Uh, Wilma Rudolph and Althea Gibson, they were a rarity. Evidently, their uh, athletic powerness showed out. But women that really was not allowed to really play sport the same as men until Title IX. And that came in 1972-73. I remember going to school fighting the principal, can we run on the track? No, you don't run on the track. The girls run in the hallway. And then finally, when they passed Title IX, we had a track team. It was me who went out and fought to get the school track team, but also been told we don't run retards on this team. So it was tough. It had a double-edged sword, not only being a black woman, but being a black woman with an intellectual disability. So that kind of cut me away from sport, but I still ran on a team. And I remember, like we always said, there's always somebody who picks you up. And I remember Mrs. Kasiba said, if anybody belongs on this team, Loretta belongs on this team. She was the one that went out and broke her back and raised the money so that we could have this girls track team, which is a student activity. So we got to remember that sport didn't really come into play for women until the 70s when they passed Title IX. Mm -hmm. And it was a little too late because I graduated from high school in 72. But it was not too late for Special Olympics, which opened my whole mind to a different world of sport and many sports. And I remember a coach saying to me, because he knew I was an angry, angry child. He knew I was taking a lot of medication for my behavior. And then one time he pulled me aside. He says, Loretta, you can go places if you put down these and use those two things down there called your feet more. Mm -hmm. And also, it's about, you know, when we look at sport, we always think about just doing that particular game. But it's about discipline. It's about acceptance. It's about respect. And I remember my coach saying to me, in order for you to be able to do sport, you have to have respect for yourself first as well as respect for your teammates. Mm -hmm. And I sometimes when I would go to sport, I remember I had one teammate, she was a little different. And then I had to put her in a place that said, you know, it's not the color of my skin that's running and beating you, it's my feet. <laughs> and I had no problem with her after that. Mm -hmm. I can also um, share with you, Athea Gibson not only played tennis, but Athea Gibson played um, golf. And a friend of mine, Renee Powell, uh, was, was uh, young, but she played with Athea Gibson. And you're talking about discrimination. They were not allowed in the clubhouse. They had to actually change clothes in the parking lot and then have the opportunity to go and be able uh, to play golf. So um, racism um, and discrimination exists. Down south, my cousins played basketball, but they had to be very careful when they traveled to play other teams in the state. And pulling over to the side of the road, they were hungry, they had to use the bathroom. They were forced to drink out of one cup. And after they finished drinking out of that cup, uh, in fact, I wrote a whole article uh, regarding uh, this matter, they threw the cup away. And so, um, it, it, it has uh, permeated Chase um, in, in uh, lots of different areas. And uh, Loretta is definitely correct, uh, not only based on gender, but also based on the color of your skin. Yeah, I mean, making the, these connections uh, just from a historical standpoint, um, you both sharing that 1972 was a seminal moment in your opportunities for sports. 
uh, through through Title IX in terms of uh, opportunities for women, um, but also just the history of uh, some uh, limited access to sports and, and including discrimination uh, that has continued on even beyond. And so when we think about uh, all of this from a historical standpoint or from your you know earlier life experiences and and we continue on to this day, there's still you know much work uh, to be done in, in terms of equity. Um, uh, to sports uh, or for sports. Um, Jesse, do, do you have an, uh, another question for Dr. Alexander and Loretta? I shared earlier how Tim Howard has served as an inspiration for me. What were some of the figures that inspired you? For me, definitely Arthur Ashe. Uh, he was an intellect. Um, he also uh, gave back uh, to the community. Uh, he uh, agreed and came with me up in Harlem, uh, talked to a young man in terms of decision of going to Harvard or going to uh, another school. Um, I really, I, I'm, I'm, uh, Arthur was a friend of mine, but I really admired him. Arthur demonstrated against apartheid in South Africa with Billie Jean King and a couple other stars. Um, so he wasn't af afraid of going down to DC and, and being arrested even right before he, he, he passed away. So um, that is one athlete that I really, really admired, Jesse. Dr. Alexander, you, you shared with me about um, uh, the, uh, the last text, the last book that uh, Arthur uh, uh, wrote, that Arthur Ashe had, had wrote. Uh, and so um, uh, definitely something that if, if it, folks are interested in learning more um, check out the um, our, uh, his autobiography. Um, you'd shared a, a, the story of of that work. Um, could you share that with the with the group? Yeah, I saw him a couple of days before he passed away, and uh, he uh, wrote this book. And he talks about uh, the Arthur Ashe uh, uh, Foundation. He talks about me in that book. Um, it uh, was published. He put it in the mail box about two days before he died and he told me I, I actually met him at his apartment he said Alpha I finished this book and he, he said you know I've got a we had a, someone had given him an office he didn't anything <laughs> given him an office um, uh, and he said do you mind taking these things to the office for me and he said um, I'm finished with this script on this book and I'm gonna drop it in the mail on, on, on Friday so um, he uh if you get a chance, try to get a hold a hold of the book. I, I think it. I'm almost sure it's still in 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 uh, print, but it, it really talks about the whole development of the Arthur Ashe Foundation and and, uh, and a lot of things about his life. Wow. Um, and Loretta, would you mind uh, talking a little bit about what impact, uh, what role did Arthur Ashe has he had in your life? He's had a big impact in my uh, life. In fact, I received the Arthur Ashe Award. And when they had that march in Washington at the White House, I got on the bus with a bunch of people and I actually walked in front of the White House. I'll never forget how hot it was. And I remember I was going to sit down and the guy looked at me, one of those guards looked at me and said, no, 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 keep walking. As long as you, you know, stayed up. And I was like, whoa. And I'll never forget that. But, Talking about Arthur Ashe and what he had to go through to play tennis was it, it was just awful. And I remember watching him on TV and who would ever thought that I would receive that award. And one of the sports I play now is tennis. Okay. So, uh, and I love it. I have this thing that I go up to this park and there's a backboard there. And one time at Special Olympics at State College, somebody says, what tennis club do you belong to? And I looked at him, I said, um, the Farquhar Park Ghetto Backboard Tennis Club, the number of members won. <laughs> the backboard always wins. But I look at the people who had an impact to me, and like I said, it was my brother who got me started. Eunice Kennedy Shriver has an impact to me for what she's done for people like me to be able to play sport. Because there was a time where people like me and Jesse were all hidden away in institutions or hidden in the bottom of your house. You weren't supposed to be seen letting on play on sport. And when she says, I'm going to, you know, these games were for people like you. I didn't think they would be here today. And here we are, what, 53 years later? Because I was so used to things coming to the project to here today and going tomorrow. 
So when I look at the people who had impacts on me, Wilma Rudolph, you, you know, she's a big impact because she had a disability. So when I look at impacts, I look at the people with the color of the skin that I have and wonder what they went through because they were before me. And just to say that the future after me won't have to go through that. And I hope that we in Special Olympics would partner up with the group in Philadelphia, the Black Women's Club, because maybe they could find uh, athletes with intellectual disability who could participate on the same playing field as their other young ladies and men. And if they can't, if they know, to direct those athletes over to us in Special Olympics. And that would be a big help for our programs to make accessibility for athletes with different abilities. Yeah, um, Jesse, that's a really great segue and bridge to another question um, that I wanted to ask. Um, and uh, Dr. Alexander, I was wondering if you could uh, share with us some of your thoughts on the current state of youth sports as well as uh, inclusive adult community sports and, and what are some of the key issues that you see? Well, unfortunately, it's called that thing called cor coronavirus. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> and um, the future of, of sports, period. Um, you know, um, I sit on the board of Parks and Recreation here. And in the state of Tennessee, the parks are not even open right now, which is a shame. Um, you know, there's a track right across the street from my cousin's house. And and it's like, I tried to advocate, you know, what's what's bad about being outside and, and walking around the track and having the opportunity to participate. You know, traditionally, it's always been accessibility uh, to uh, facilities, uh, particularly in big cities like Philadelphia and New York and, and, and things of that sort. So, you know, that's one area. And in terms of how we're gonna deal with this pandemic, um, you know, future wise, because they're talking about resurgent uh, coming apart, apart. But also I think it's very important that uh, we have leadership uh, at the tables uh, that look like us and able to sit down and make power decisions where the power table is and give input. And so for people to be able to see people in, in important positions um, that um, look like them and they can inspire to have the opportunity uh, to uh, one day sit at the table and uh, be able to you know, give some input in their perspective. So I, I think that's extremely important. Um, and then um, you know, with the uh, sports really were becoming in terms of economically very uh, expensive. You know, so that's another thing uh, in terms of how can we make it affordable uh, uh, for uh, our youth in our country. Um, I tend to, um, I, I sat on the Olympic Co Committee Board of Directors for 20 plus years, and I really believe in a pipeline being developed. So from the beginning all the way to the end. And one of the examples is a program that we started in Harlem, uh, the Peter Westbrook Foundation, the fencing and if you look in Japan, uh, about four or five of the athletes on the, on the USA fencing team will be coming straight from that Peter Westbrook Foundation. And how did that happen? We reached back and we developed those kids, worked with them. Uh, the, the model that the Black Women Sports Foundation worked academically with them. We have an academic program adjacent to that program, developed their skills at a young age and continue to help support them and get them the best training to come all the way through the pipeline to the end. So uh, those are some, some of the things. Um, I think it's um, one last thing. I cannot stress how important it is of giving back. Um, I was a great friend uh, with Flojo. You know, Flojo was the nails, Loretta, you know, yes. <laughs> fashion, you know, they she, she <laughs> took it to all the different other level. But yes. also, she wrote children's books, you know, she gave back. Um, she gave back to the community. And I can't tell you how important it is you have to give back and, and, and contribute to the commu community and for young kids to be able to see you and help pull them along. 
and, and continue to support them to come along taste. Yeah, but, well, thank you for highlighting how important it is to have representation uh, in leadership positions, as well as just um, programs that op like to uh, open up access. Um, you know, there's still a uh, significant uh, lower level of participation rates among um, children of minority groups, African Americans, as well as uh, Hispanics and Asian uh, children uh, in sports. Um, the cost of sports, like you mentioned, it's yes. um, it can sometimes be over a thousand dollars annually for sports participation um, per person. And you know, we're certainly grateful and thankful for the work that uh, everyone in this whole community does to uh, maintain. Uh, access to free sports that are inclusive uh, for people uh, with intellectual disabilities, um, but you know, there's still so much work to be done in the in the broader world uh, of sports in terms of uh, equity and um, and access. Um, I, I, we we want to make sure we get to our, our Q and A. We have some questions, um, but uh, Jesse, I think this this last question is a really important one. Um, could you share uh, our last question with Dr. Alexander and Loretta? How can sport organizations be more inclusive and representative of all people? How can we promote understanding and awareness of history and heritage? Well, I think uh, talking about understanding the promotion of history and heritage, that has to be done in the schools where, where children are very young. You don't wait till somebody gets 30 and 40 and try to get them to understand it. So we have to start with the very young and this starts really before the school if the parent has time. You saw on the program earlier where some of these parents say it's seven hours. Those kids get up and go to school, they come home. They're not even fed a meal. And by the time they do get home, thank God they had that program in Philadelphia that they can help these young children. It's a program like that that can promote that whole history. It's programs like that that can promote more of understanding of African Americans and people of colors. But when you look at Special Olympics, we're doing it with sport. And not so much as promoting black history, but we're promoting inclusion of all people through our school programs called Unified Champion Schools, where they go into the elementary and they talk to children about people with intellectual disability of all color. And then from there, you go to the middle school and their programs broader and in the high school and college is sport where people are playing together. And hopefully after uh, maybe a next generation or two of these folks, by the time they go into the workforce, people with intellectual disabilities and other different backgrounds will have the inclusion effect. So Special Olympics has been doing it so much in the schools. Do we focus on looking for African-Americans or the black history? No, that's not our program. Our program is to invite people of all colors and abilities, not just ID, people with intellectual disabilities to come together in the classroom to learn about each other with and without intellectual disability. And we use that sport as a vehicle to get students to understand and be able to work together. I think um, uh, organizations such as uh, our organization, the Black Women Sports Foundation, uh, not only do we work with young kids and youth uh, and high school uh, students and collegiate students, um, we also are in the breadth of administrators, coaches, uh, athletic directors. So we sort of uh, in wide uh, breadth. Um, when I was at uh, Temple and my master's um, thesis uh, was on the whole status of women in the country in athletics. And it, the, the thing that was so unique about it, it wasn't focused just on African-American women. It was focused on Asian women and, and uh, Hispanic women and, and what sports they participate in. Even till today, people still cite, cite that story. But I, I, I think it's important also the collaboration with groups such as Special Olympics, our organization being able to co collaborate uh, with uh, other like organizations and uh, really be able to to make an impact, uh, Jesse, in, 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 in the United States. That's extremely important. You, um, it's, it's, it's important to be able to collaborate and work with different groups to be able to uh, uh, accomplish what we really would like to accomplish. Well, um, we certainly look forward to continuing the work um, here in Special Olympics Pennsylvania and collaborating uh, with organizations like the Black Women in Support Foundation uh, would love to do. Uh, exactly what Loretta challenged us to do. 
uh, to work together to, to bring more opportunities um, for sports across ability and, uh, and across uh, different cultural identities that, that we have in a city, uh, as well as across you know, other parts of the uh, state as well. I, I certainly want to recognize the incredible work um, that's happening in places like York and Pittsburgh and, and Jesse's home uh, town of Harrisburg um, to bring uh, people together. And so um, it's not just happening in Philadelphia. Um, I think, um, you know, really want to just mention with that uh, final word of the conversation, just how grateful we are um, to you, Dr. Alexander and, and Loretta. I uh, really appreciate you, you coming on to share your stories, sure. uh, sharing some history and sharing uh, some challenges towards uh, the future to continue uh, to, to do this work um, and, and also to help us recognize and celebrate Black History Month. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Um, Jesse, do you want to um, transition us to uh, a quick Q&A? It's now time for some Q&A. You can submit your questions to the Q&A box and Chase will read them. Yeah. Um, so we have a few questions. Um, uh, we, um, first one, uh, Loretta, this question is for you. And this is from, uh, I believe it's Franz. Uh, what belt did you make in, uh, in karate? I made it up to fourth degree black belt and I was one kata away from my fifth dawn. And the sad thing was the reason why I couldn't get my fifth dawn is because I couldn't afford the equipment that required the samurai sword, the atomic of skirt, and it was very expensive. And that's kind of where I ended fourth degree black belt with this that much farther away, I would have been a fifth dawn. But my mom took sick and I took care of her and she was more important than any degree. Um, uh, this question I believe would be for either of you, Dr. Alexander or, or Loretta. Um, I also, sorry, let me take a moment to uh, welcome in um, uh, Tolu Omakore and uh, Lucy Mason, uh, who are uh, both affiliated with the Black Women in Sport Foundation uh, to join us uh, in this conversation. We really welcome your perspectives uh, I hope it's fair to say uh, that you provide some young perspectives um, uh, in terms of your know, sports experience. So thank you both for, for joining us. Um, uh, as college athletes, uh, highly competitive NCAA athletes, we, we appreciate um, your you know, experiences with sports. And as you continue to do that in, in making your careers around the world of sport. Um, this question um, is one um, from Brittany, and um, Brittany asks uh, a really reflective question. Why do Black people seem to have to overcome so many obstacles because of their skin color? Why is it still an issue nowadays uh, in certain areas or with certain people? Uh, uh, Brittany shared that she was raised, uh, Brittany was raised to not judge anyone because of their skin color. Skin color shouldn't matter. Um, just wanted to see if anyone had any uh, faults or reflections uh, to share with uh, with Brittany. Well, I guess it was since you know history, all the way throughout history, the darker skin the person was. If you go back in political times, when most people were dark skin, they were overruled by lighter colored skin people. But when you look at the last hundred, two hundred, three hundred years. I don't know why, because everyone should have value. If anyone believes in God, there, there is no color. There, there, we're his children. But even still today, you, you'll run into somebody. And I used to get really angry and would want to fight them. But nowadays, I just look at him and go, shut it off, you know, swipe it off. And I'll just look at him and say, hmm. I remember one time growing up and a girl across the street from me, she's a white girl. Every time I walked by, she had it snarky name to call me. So my mom didn't tolerate, you know, us fighting. And then one day I just turned around. And I said, look who's sitting in the sun trying to get like me. I said, I'm black and I'm proud. And I, hmm. and I just walked away from her because I knew she was instigating a fight. I said, I have to sit in the sun. I said, obviously I must be who you would like to be and walked away from her. And it will continue. And there's different instances. I remember a coach in Special Olympics kept telling me to get to the back of the bus. 
And I got so angry at her and I just looked at her at the training camp. I said, you know what? We're coming back to go to Nagano in a couple of weeks. Can you do me one favor? Read a book called Rosa Parks. It's easy read and you'll understand where I come from. Well, thank you, but anyone else have any um, thoughts or, or responses or reactions to Brittany's question around um, really the like a, a history of discrimination uh, is a big one. Um, but I uh, wanted to see if anyone else had any thoughts. Well, I, I think that uh, with um, Brittany, um, um, what happened with her and um, the, the deaths this summer, the Black Lives Matter marches, um, the uh, coronavirus, uh, the differentiation, the economic differences, it really has spilled back to show uh, in, in terms of this country really needs to deal with some racial injustice. And uh, Breonna Taylor, um, you know, uh, George Floyd, the, the, um, it really has uh, uh, peeled off the scab of a wound and it really has emerged itself. And, and I think in all types of different areas, uh, there needs to be work and, and address to it. Look at the WNBA, look at the NBA, look at the NFL uh, in terms of what they're trying to address. Uh, obviously color does matter and color does matter even on the upper echelon in terms of in the boardrooms and being able to have voice and leadership uh, where the real meaning and, and decisions are made that implicate uh, people that um, uh, participate in all those different uh, sports itself. So, um, you know, look, look, look at uh, South Africa and what they went through apartheid and uh, the, the elimination of apartheid uh, and, and, and the fight for that. Uh, there's still a lot of work though to be done in, in this country. Um, and skin color does matter. Uh, you know, back in the day, uh, during the, the World War, uh, they incarcerated uh, Japanese Americans. And uh, they actually, you know, received checks after they were incarcerated after that. So uh, there's some things that definitely need to be uh, addressed in this country. But the inequities, uh, some of the inequities in sport and being able to express our voice and help out in other areas like Black Lives Matter, I think is extremely important. I'm very proud of the WNBA um, um, players and also uh, the NBA, LeBron James and, and uh, athletes, uh, you know, of those sort. Um, mm. That's that's my set, Chase. My great grandma was murdered because of the color of her skin in 1969 and that scab never healed. But you know what, I believe in God. And like Martin Luther King said at one time, you know, Faith takes over fear. And that's what I faithfully believe in today. And I also believe in, you know, faith is taking the first step even when you don't see the whole staircase. So I try not to let the negativity bother me. And I try to look the other way and think about things that are positive. I still get down today, you know, when the Brianna Taylor and everything. And I said, you know what? My great grandma was murdered and was nothing. They never found who killed her. To this day, and this summer, we went to the cemetery. They didn't even have the audacity to spell her name right on the grave. And I got a picture of it on my phone. So it's still there, but you gotta push on and stay strong and use our voice and use it peacefully. The power of word can be very, very powerful. It can be more powerful than the power of a fist. One of the um, one of our uh, participants shared a, a question. Um, someone who happens to be uh, a multi-team coach, um, someone who coaches both a high school tennis team, a Special Olympics tennis team, and also a unified team. Uh, unified sports um, brings people with and without intellectual disabilities together uh, on the same uh, teams. Um, and the coach is asking, um, how can coaches help the work that people like the Black Women's Sport Foundation are doing? Um, how can coaches, um, you know, help t do some of the work that we're um, talking about in terms of, you know, education, uh, promoting 
uh, access and representation. Um, any, any thoughts or suggestions on how a coach can impact uh, you know, the life of an individual as well as an organization? Um, maybe a good question for uh, Cholu or, or Lucy, um, any like impact that coaches have had on your lives? Yeah, I've had a lot of um, coaches in my life um, I consider all my coaches as my mentors, especially playing basketball at the age of 13. Um, definitely had a, people, a lot of people there support me. Uh, my mom was working a lot, so I had coaches pick me up for practice, AU tournaments, things like that. So I will say the coaches that's been in my life has played such a huge role, especially they care so much. Um, they helped me get to where I was at at UCF by getting the scholarship. So um, they definitely, there are people out there that, who cares, um, and they don't care just but if you have your talents as an athlete, but also as a person, right. They helped me grow. Um, I had a quite a little bit of female coaches. You see a lot of male coaches in basketball, um, definitely could respect a lot of the female coaches. That was kind of, I probably like five, I will say, mm -hmm. um, but they were, they were amazing. Um. Uh, helped me to be the young woman I am today, but I definitely think all my coaches have been in my life. And I would agree. I think, you know, coaches play a tremendous role in, in the development of who you are as a person. Um, and, you know, playing sports since I was, you know, three or four years old, you know, I can think back to and probably name almost all of the coaches that I've ever played for um, because they've had that big of a role and an impact in my life. And so, it's one of those things where, you know, they cared about you as a person. They cared that you were um, being the best person you could be, being the best student you can be, being the best athlete that you can be. Um, and so for me, I appreciate that because with each one of them, I learned a lesson about myself um, and it made me a better person. It, it helped me to figure out, you know, the things that I was interested in. And one of the things that I can say that I appreciate the most is that, you know, for a lot of younger athletes now, you see them playing one sport and that's it. Mm -hmm. And I had the support of all of my coaches where, you know, I was able to play basketball and softball and run track and all of my, co my coaches supported that. And that's rare to find these days. Um, you know, a lot of places want you to specialize in just one sport, but, you know, getting the opportunity to do different things, you meet different people, you get to work different muscles, um, and so, you know, for me, that was really big um, because, again, it allowed me to meet people that I may not have met um, in any other setting. Yeah, the sports specialization is definitely another uh, aspect of the modern day of sports. Um, Jesse, uh, could you, you, you spoke at the beginning about the different sports activities that you play. You're not just a goalkeeper in soccer. Um, can you share with us maybe one last word? Um, as uh, unfortunately we are running over time uh, because this is just really scratching the surface of such an important uh, topic. Um, but let me get back to you, Jesse, to uh, share with us um, how important it is to you to be able to play multiple sports uh, and what that means to you. Basically what it means to me is it gives me the opportunity to go out and you know meet, make new friends you know, just have fun, you know, doing a sport that, you know, that you basically participated in, you know, like for so many years and having fun with what you're doing. Well, uh, again, thank you all very much. This is uh, almost feels like too abrupt of an end, uh, but definitely want to respect everybody's time. Uh, this is a very important conversation. Uh, we, we hope that we accomplish some of the goals of, uh, on one part, celebrating uh, the impact of uh, Black Americans on sport and the history of um, Black Americans, um, and also introducing some of the, um, that history and ongoing work, uh, thanks to organizations uh, like the Black Women's Sport Foundation. Um, so uh, thank you, Dr. Alexander. Thank you, Loretta. Uh, thank you, uh, Kayla. Thank you, Tolu. And thank you, Lucy, very much for your time and energy uh, for our, our special in Pennsylvania community tonight. So, um, Jesse, let's uh, wrap things up. 
This concludes our Team Tuesday's webinar. Our next one will be Tuesday, March 16th at 7 p.m. As a reminder, these webinars are recorded and posted to the SOPA YouTube channel. Thank you to everyone uh, for joining and, and staying uh, with us for uh, a couple minutes extra tonight, maybe uh, additional 20 minutes. Uh, we thank you so much. Uh, I wanna give a special thank you to Jesse. Uh, it was really great working with you throughout all of the planning and preparation um, and for leading us to this webinar tonight. Um, it, it was really a pleasure working with you, Jesse. We will see you all again next month. And until then, stay healthy and stay safe.